And as you can see, BIC is um, very engaged in this discussion that's going on. We've been engaged at the highest levels of government, both at the federal and at the state level, as we've heard from Tony and the National Transport Commission, so, and some of the state associations. So it's important, first of all, just to recognise that the industry is on the front foot. We're actually out there talking about this stuff and what the role of bus should be in the future. Uh, Paul Redder said earlier that um, the rail industry are looking at running buses, you know, so threw it, threw it out there. But the other side of that is that the bus industry is looking at running trains because an autonomous bus that's linked by Bluetooth and you've got 20 of them is a train. It's only got one advantage and it's one big advantage. It can decouple and go off the infrastructure and deliver people directly to where they want to come. So let's not get too frightened about actually where bus is going to be, be because the opportunities if we're thinking seriously about autonomous vehicles is how they're actually linked together and how we get the most efficiency out of our existing infrastructure, which could mean that our rail corridors are a thing of the past in the, when we look down the track, and perhaps when we look at light rail, we're building already an obsolete um, mode because of the nature of its fixed infrastructure. But I'll come back to that. One of the important things about this discussion is to actually come back to a lot of the research that the BIC has been undertaking over the past decade. Uh, under the leadership of Professor John Stanley, who heads our research committee and is prim the primary author of all of our research. And what that, that's been about is actually in the context of where we're heading as a nation and where we're heading in the context of our cities, what are the keys? What, are, what do we need to do? And, that's, and what we've identified in all of that research is that we need to make sure that our planning, our land use, and our integrated transport are actually driving the key outcomes that we want from our land transport network. And those are key outcomes are simple. And if future mobility doesn't deliver these outcomes, and they're not considered in the context of this discussion, then we're on the wrong track. So what are those key outcomes we're seeking from how we move people and how we want our cities and regions to develop? We want to make sure that our cities grow and develop so that we're managing an ageing and growing population. And we'll just come back to that briefly shortly. We want to manage congestion. We want to make sure that road safety is actually the top, top priority in the context of how we move people around our cities, however they get around. We want to actually make sure that personal health is taken into account. And I'm just going to touch on that one briefly in a second. We want to make sure that people are actually socially included and not excluded as part of this exercise. And that like in the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority uh, question I asked earlier, that people aren't actually excluded and that only the well-heeled rich folk are actually able to get a late night service. We've got to make sure that freight is able to be moved efficient, efficiently. That's an important way that the economy is actually, the productivity of the economy has to be driven because if we move people efficiently, we move freight efficiently, and that drives a better and more productive economy. And we've actually got to make sure that we make the right infrastructure investments and that we actually can pay for it. In other words, we actually have got the revenue, the dollars, to make that investment. So, very important that this whole discussion uh, isn't a Jetson-styled view of the world, and I don't think we've had that today. I think Tony Braxton Smith and MTC presented a fairly solid, uh, good overview of where we need to go in the context of uh, future policy development and how we do it, but let's make sure that we keep it in that context because one of the things <coughs> that's a reality in some of the discussion out there is that autonomous vehicles and technology are some form of magic footing going to solve the ills of the world and everything will be perfect. Well, I don't think it always works out that way and there's a lot of challenges and hence I believe the long time frame that we're talking about and the, where we're heading which is out in the 2030, 2040, 2050 because to get it right is going to actually take some um, serious, serious work. But the problem with new technology and new vehicles and all this fun stuff is that politicians get very excited, very excited. They can't wait to stand in front and announce it. Now, I'm not saying that the minister that I'm just about to put up to the board is excited. I think he's got a vision. I think it's fantastic. But what the industry needs to do is make sure that we keep on top of it and make sure that politicians don't start running an agenda that we can't keep pace with. And that's part of the problem that happened with Uber. They got ahead of the game. Government wasn't ready. Taxi industry wasn't ready. And the ball game was over before we got there. Now, whether we get the right outcome out of Uber and the taxi industry is another question altogether. But Let's have a look at that video from a, a news item last week, which I think puts this into some reality and scope of where it was. City buses and trains, two of the first things that come to mind are timetables and drivers. Well, now we're being told both are headed for extinction and soon. 
From next year, commuters will be able to simply order a bus on their smartphone. Daniel Sutton explains. Late trains, late buses. For years, timetable woes have plagued every transport minister. The system is letting us down. Processes do break down. I don't think there is a quick fix. But Andrew Constance thinks he's found one. I want to do away with timetables. Instead, he wants a system similar to this one, kicking off in the US, where commuters order a bus on their smartphone. An app groups requests together then dispatches a vehicle on a custom route. If we have on-demand movies, we should have on-demand transport. The minister wants a private operator to run a trial here next year. If it works, timetables will go under the bus. Sydney's new metro will also be timetable-free when it opens. Timetables regulate services and often deliver poor services as a consequence. Yep, I believe we should get rid of them. Experts believe existing train stations are a logical place for on-demand buses to start. Services which could pick up a group of commuters who live in the local area and bring them to and from the station, eliminating the need to build car parks here. The next to go, bus drivers. Australia's first autonomous bus is already being trialled in Perth. Within 15 years, uh, it will be the norm. From the union representing drivers... Is it real? I mean, do we still believe in the Easter Bay? They really need to go back to slow. And as public transport gets smarter, experts predict it will get smaller too. Think of autonomous cars, especially when their, their spacing is programmed by computers, as a simply a string of seats along a road, which we call a bus at the moment. Time, we're told, to get on board. Daniel Sutton, 10 Eyewitness News. So that's all good stuff, but let's keep it all in context. And, but <clears throat> it's a reality, and the politicians are on board, so we need to be on board. Just to go back to those key outcomes I wanted to touch upon when we looked at an ageing and growing population. Um, ageing population is often seen as the... Oh, did I do that? That's all right, I can say that. You can look at that. Um, ageing population is obviously seen as this uh, baby boomers moving into this period where we're going to have all these e extra people over 65 who just by the way, happen to be healthier than they ever have been before and are all more, more tech savvy than ever before. Um, and the other side of that is Gen X and Gen Y, where, you know, they've been born with a silver phone in their mouth and they know how to use it and that's how they get around. And they're very, you know, they're, gonna, they're staying at home longer, they're not getting their licences, having a car isn't an ambition to go and buy a car as quickly as possible and they're good at using PC and other services. My view is there isn't a generational difference. I think. The older, the boomers are actually a little bit slower, but they're actually going to be right there and have a, a greater demand for on-demand type services rather than owning their cars. So, interestingly, we look at ageing and growing population. The other one is health. If we end up with um, autonomous vehicles picking everyone up from door to door, then what happens to personal health? We know that currently people that catch mass transit or public transport get, a, transit, get about 41 minutes of incidental exercise a day just by walking to and from the bus stop or the train station to and from the office. If they drive, currently they get about eight minutes. Now, if we're going to stop all exercise or we don't take that into account about what the impacts on health, the health budget is, maybe there are consequences there. So they're the kind of discussions that Vic's involved in at a very broad level, just to give you a, an idea. This uh, really just tries to sum up where we're at. And all of that stuff on there is connect, talking about customer demand and the types of transport services. The reality is, the Ubers and the Lyfts and the Bridges of the world they aren't actually transport companies necessarily. They're actually technology people who are connecting the passenger with the, the vehicle provider. So there's no reason why any of this stuff is beyond the scope of a bus operator to move into. It doesn't have to be a 12-seater bus that's got a bridge sign on it. It could be any of your, your businesses doing something extra that value adds to your existing government contracts, whatever they might be in the future. So. What is the future intersection between ride sourcing, autonomous vehicles and public transport? I think it's probably pretty clear that trunk services and mass transit are going to continue to be a, a core focus and priority and those core spines, whether it's heavy rail or bus rapid transit or dedicated um, roadways, are going to continue to be a core focus to move lots of people quickly. The first and last mile is an interesting concept, which is where there's some scope for uh, where Uber and others think there's some scope for them to move into a space that's currently probably delivered through um, bus feeder services. And there's an interesting debate about peak and off-peak off services, and such as late-night services. So peak services, highly patronised, off-peak services, not so. 
what's the story there in relation to where bus fits. So the bridge story I mentioned earlier today is sort of part of that discussion and it's going on but let's not forget that the bus industry's got the expertise to actually fill those gaps as well. And then there's the issue of mobility and accessibility for all and I'm interested in, you know, regional Uber. What does that actually mean? Where does it exist? Why would they go there? It's not commercial. And this commercially driven services is fine for cities where the densities drive a passenger outcome. But when you get to regional, rural or remote areas, how's that going to work? And what kind of initiatives can the industry look at to feed into that? And obviously I mentioned before, the whole, the whole social basis of providing public transports all revolves around minimum service levels and community service obligations that governments a long time adopted to make sure that people weren't being left behind. The mass transit is different from the social transit. Both of them have the minimum service levels because they're trying to deliver different outcomes. Mass transit might be more focused on congestion, social transit more on social inclusion, but those kind of bases that drive the policy outcomes for transport provision are gonna be the key drivers for future mobility. And I don't think, and I think that was recognised today as well. So as you see, you see the question, how does this all work to achieve what we want to do? Um, that's just a quote from John Zimmer. He's the co-founder and president of Lyft. And basically all it says is we're looking to fill in the hole. We're filling in the last and, the last and first mile. We think ride sourcing is going to become cheaper in the next decade, and that's where we're going to live, folks. So that's a reality, and that's their business model. But there's no reason why it's not this industry's business model to actually work out how, over the next 10 years, we're actually filling that space rather than allowing interlopers, if that's what you want to call them, or opportunists, or entrepreneurs. It depends how, what your mindset is. I call them entrepreneurs. If I was a bus operator, I'd call them interlopers and bugger off. Um, it's already been mentioned today, so 50% of the cost of operating a bus is in the labour of the driver, and so what does that mean in the context of um, future subsidy, subsidies for public transport provision and how we're going to manage that issue? And that's going to change the business model necessarily if we move down the autonomous vehicle path, but I don't think autonomous vehicles in the context of what we're doing now is coming as soon as we actually probably think, but we need to be ready. So are buses in and out? Yes. Bus rapid transit, light rail and heavy rail, they're going to continue to provide those core trunk services. Uber and micro transit, my view is, are they competition? Probably not. Are they partners? Probably. Is it an opportunity for diversified businesses in your own sense? Yes. So there's some opportunities there, but I don't think it's a competition. I think it's an opportunity. Um, more flexible bus contracts, well, you know, and, and I guess more passenger transport re regulation reform. How are your contracts and the regula regulatory environment you currently operate limiting your capacity to look at diversifying the, the use of your depots, your fleets, how you run them? You know, at the moment, a lot of our contractual arrangements are very master-servant, government operator, master-servant. Actually, the partnership arrangement there become more and more critical so we can move into that kind of space. Autonomous vehicles and car ownership in itself is an interesting dynamic. And I've put up there the cost and convenience. People over time are saying the cost and convenience of autonomous vehicles will determine that people will make a decision, a different decision about owning a car. The car ownership won't be a focus because the cost and convenience of autonomous vehicles will mean that they're getting just as good a travel outcome as owning their own car. There's also the argument of personal autonomy and the rev heads in the room will know that you're not going to give up your V8, are you Neil Dyson? You'll be driving that around forever, chucking burnouts down your main street like you do at the moment. Um, so there's a personal autonomy issue which is actually deeply psychological as well how people manage this personal autonomy issue that, how do you actually, well, Ben's another one of those rare bits in the room. Um, but how do you, how you actually manage that issue? Because the interaction between autonomous vehicles and a driven vehicle is where the real problems arise. Autonomous vehicles won't run into each other, it's the others. So there's got to be a mechanism to actually work out on that. And <clears throat> if we've got autonomous vehicles, how do we manage driverless non-parking fleets that are constantly 24 hours running around? Well. My view is they've got to stop sometime. And the best place to stop is in a bus depot. So you've already got the depot, you've already got the rostering, the scheduling, the skills. Where else are they going to go when they've got to stop overnight or for maintenance? So, a different paradigm. Autonomous bus, is this the future? Flexible infrastructure as opposed to fixed. Flexible services and vehicles. Better utilisation of existing rail corridors. So I just sort of throw that out there. I think it's a different look at it. But we, we put bitumen over the light rail of the tram system in Sydney when the car was introduced. Perhaps there's opportunities to look at some of the 
the rail corridors, it's not necessarily the metro, it's not necessarily the, the solid trunks, but some of those suburban spurs that are running off are probably opportunities to look at where autonomous buses could actually operate and, then, and have the opportunity then for them to, as I say, uh, separate and, and then provide further services into the suburbs, whether they're large buses or lots of little buses all connected. So I think uh, back to the future a little bit is probably some scope from the bus industry perspective. And thank you. Oh, I didn't have that. Actually, that's not true. I haven't finished. I thought this was very interesting, actually. Future Mobility in Three Models, McKinsey and Partners released this um, in October, just past. They basically came up and said there's three sort of models that exist currently for mobility. You've got countries like Amsterdam, Singapore, Stockholm, only a small, but they've already got in place effective mobility, efficient public transport, encourage cycling and walking and managing congestion and pollution and put quite strong restrictions on uh, car use in built up areas. So they're saying by 2030, those kind of countries are probably ready to move into sort of an advanced transport uh, model. There's a, a private autonomy, which is where development and commuting patterns have increased sprawl significantly. So, you know, places like Los Angeles, where you've got long distance, even though their public transport patronage is on the increase, they still have the challenges of, you know, having a car as being essential because of the distances. And so, likely it will remain the case for a while, but a bit of a longer time frame. And places like Delhi, Mexico City, Mumbai, densely populated, rapid urbanisation, big congestion and pollution, a lot of pedestrians, and the autonomous vehicles are probably a long way off just because of those reasons. So probably more focused on clean and shared services, more environmentally friendly and sharing services to try and reduce their congestion. So where do we fit? Probably in somewhere in between effective mobility and, and private autonomy. And NTC may have it right out in about 2040, 2050. And the last slide, which we've heard about today, I mean, I think I wrote about this recently, but I think when you think about is does the industry want to be diversified and revolutionary and lead the charge? Do we want to be evolutionary and just adapt as technology proceeds and see what happens? So you end at the top of the food chain through evolution, or the other option for evolution is you end up extinct and you end up filling in multiple you know, gap services. So We've suggested to the National Transport Commission we should have a bus, bus futures working group put in place, which may more, morph into a passenger transport futures working group. And we actually get some operators and, and executive directors around a table with government and look at what the restrictions currently are within contractual arrangements and regulation and legislation to free up your opportunity to be a lot more entrepreneurial. Now I'm finished.